jump on in? Yes, you go ahead, Carol. Sure, it's recorded, good. All right, so I would like to welcome everyone to the Voices of Black Experience. Uh, tonight, we're gonna to be talking about confronting racial terror. I'm your host, fourth generation Red Banker, Dr. Carol Penn, doubly board certified in family medicine and obesity medicine, your master movement meditation and mindset coach, and now three-time best-selling author. I have been the moderator for these panels and I was sharing with Amy, I'm just so proud that our community has come together. And I think some of the conversations that we have been having have been revelatory. I think we have ventured out where a lot of people have not been willing to venture out. And I feel that there's been a lot of courageous conversations then tonight, it'll be no different. So I'd like to welcome all of you. We've, oh my goodness, we have Reverend Kerwin Webb is here, uh, Stephen Kluttner, uh, Ms. Teresa Jones, Denise Fredericks, Cassandra Keys, Marsha Horn, Donna Corman, of course, the committee members, Sarah Kluttner, uh, Lorraine Stone, of course, you know, Amy, uh, Sharon Lucas, uh, Kathleen, who is new with us tonight, Molly and Rick are here, Molly Walker and Rick Goldberger, uh, Judy Stevens, and our special guests, Sandra Thompson and Inez Hennessy, both uh, local to this area. So what are we going to be talking about? This local his history of racial uh, violence, I like to call this you know, the experience of racialized terror. There are some of us here that have had direct experience with that and are descendants of people who had direct experience of racialized terror here in Monmouth County. And, you know, it is an urban myth that, you know, oh my goodness, this is New Jersey, this is Monmouth County, that didn't go on here. Well, it did go on here. So we have two of the representatives of the New Jersey Social Justice Remembrance Coalition are going to be discussing the process of memorializing a lynching that took place in Eatontown, New Jersey in 1886. The victim was a 66 year old formerly enslaved man named Samuel Johnson, known as Mingo Jack. This act of racially motivated terror was first commemorated in 2012 by a group of Eatontown residents, including author Jane Stone, who wrote a book, The Murder of Mingo Jack. As the need for racial justice continues to be outrageously evident, the coalition is working with Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative to also place a monument on the site, which will correspond to the thousands of monuments that render visible the atrocious history of lynching in the US at the Equal Justice Initiative's Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. So, we're here to talk about that, to bring that to light. Go ahead and put it in the chat if you were aware that their lynching had occurred here in Monmouth County. So this is the only recorded one. It doesn't mean it was the only one that happened. So just go ahead and drop it in the chat if you were aware that there was a history of lynching in Monmouth County. And right here in Eatontown, which is you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes from the front door, of where most of us are currently living. Okay, so say yeah. Yeah, so some people, you know, fairly new knowledge and fairly recent knowledge. How many of you knew that this was also, uh, families were targeted and the Klan was very active here in these towns of Little Silver and Red Bank and Fair Haven and Asbury Park, Eaton Town, Middletown, very active Klan area. And so this is a lot of the history that got hidden that didn't make it into the history books, right? And here we all are now neighbors living amongst each other. So I'm just setting the stage for a, a little bit. And, you know, you look around and kind of think, well, why are things the way they are? You know, 
you know, you know, why does this group seem this way or this group seem this way? Well, you know, when you look upstream of it, there are things that have happened that haven't been brought to light and thankfully are just now being brought to light. So maybe we will all have a better understanding of each other after these stories are told. But, you know, kind of, you know, hidden in plain sight, you know, why are some neighbor, you know, why have some people never had a black neighbor or why have some people never had a white neighbor? Why has some people, you know, seem to, you know, graduate from certain school systems in the area and go on and have successful careers and others just seem to disappear? What happened to those people? You know, do you, do, do you question that? Do you think about that? All right, so, so some, in 1978, I saw a KKK lighting of the cross behind the racetrack. And other people, yes, I'm aware of the KKK and other activities. Yes, Southern Poverty Law Institute uh, publications. So yes, yeah, so different you know, levels of awareness here within the group. And again, great opportunity to bring it together. All right, so the stage has been set. Our first speaker is Ms. Sandra Thompson, who was so instrumental in, in, in being I think, you know, she was the litmus point for bringing this group of Eatontown residents together once she found out about the history of Mingo Jack. So, uh, Ms. Thompson, I'm going to ask you to share a little bit about your story, about, you know, what, you know, where you were working and what you were doing at the time and how you became aware of Mingo Jack. Thank you, Dr. Penn. Thank um, you. I like to thank the Voices of the Black Experience for the invitation. Uh, regarding your first question, uh, we all were working at Fort Monmouth and didn't realize it. We're, I was on uh, Meyer Center and the others were on the main post. And then one day, uh, James Stone did a presentation at the library and we were all there and listening to him said, boy, this is interesting. And we started talking about it. And shortly afterwards, I said, well, we need to do something about it. And so no one spoke up. So then I took the lead. And that's how it kind of started and all the things that we did. So just let me read a little background. Samuel Mingo Jack Johnson. The author of his book was uh, James Stone. Mingo was born in 1820, March 5th, uh, 1886. <laughs> At the age of 66, he lived at Colts Neck. He was abandoned by his parents and raised by a white Dan Holly family. The Laird used Johnson as a slave and, became, and because of his size, he was short and stocky as a jockey. Uh, March 5th, 1886. Mingle was an African-American man falsely accused of rape and hanged by a mob of white men in Eatontown Wampum Park, Eatontown. He sat in a two cell lockup awaiting trial after being accused of raping a white woman, Angelina Herbert, 1862 to 1893. The trial never happened. Mingle was arrested at his home by Constable Herbert Eisenhall, chief of police at the Mammoth Park where Mingo was at work. It was word on the street Mingo would be lynched before morning. That night, Allen's Saloon, which was located on Main Street in uh, Eatontown, a number of men, men were at the saloon in Eatontown. A large mob of about 75 who've been drinking went to the jail about 11.40 p.m shot in the windows, broke into the jail. Screams were heard by, Afri uh, by an African couple, William and Sarah Buckford, who lived nearby. They were terrified. They stayed in their home. Mingle put up a good fight. They gouged out his eyes. His body was found by a six-year-old boy, Dick Stevens, early the next morning. Prosecutor 
James Stein, a graduate of Princeton at the age of 19, practicing law in Eatontown, 1897. He then became the mayor of Eatontown. George Beekman, another prominent lawyer of the same air inquest, Stein was able to get information from witnesses saying that Mingle was elsewhere uh, near the same time of the attack. The person asked Angeline, do you know Mingle Jack? She thought that that's who it was. The inquest jury a verdict decided that Mingle was mur murdered. Wait a minute. The, the inquest jury verdict decided that Mingle was murdered by unknown persons. Jacob Coffin, an editor of the Eaton Town Advisors, should be rebuilt for condoning such mob violence in an editorial published the day after the lynching. Subsequently, Frank Dangler. Edward Johnson, George Sickler, and William Snyder were arrested for murder. Douglas, a painter by trade, was a prime sex, sub, sub, uh, suspect since he was seen, and seen with nose, throat, and hand injuries the day after the lynching. That's, just, that's all I have right now. Okay. Turn it over to Inez. Good evening. Okay, continuing. Um, Allen Saloon, which is still in Eatontown on the corner in Main Street. The night before the lynching, where the rope was passed around, Sickles was a young farmhand who testified that he walked by the jail around midnight and heard someone screaming, murder, murder. Snickler, a, lo uh, a local loafer, who seemed to have been spending money even though he didn't work, was very drunk the night of the lynching and was still drinking the next morning where he boasted that he helped pull the rope. They were, they were released on bail and never prosecuted. Constable Liebenthal was also arrested on a warrant for manslaughter for not guarding Bingo Jack. He was released on bail and the case was dropped. The Mingle Jack murder received a great deal of publicity in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. Uh, the mystery of who really raped Angela, uh, Angelina was never solved. Two subsequent conversations only made the puzzle more complex. Richard Kearney, on death row for murder admitted to the rape by recanting his confession before his execution. Later the same year, a sailor named John Miller also confessed to the rape before he died of, of um, fibroid fever on a three master, no, a three mast schooner, the Congo, sailing out of New Belford. Very, um, Mingo Jack is supposed to be buried in Locust Memorial Grove Cemetery in Eatontown, which is behind the old Quick Check on Wyckoff Road. And Mingo Jack was married to Lucy, had five children, and he was living in Eatontown. And what we have been told that the house is still there um, by Sanja. What is that name of that oh, road? It's Grant Avenue, 137. Grant Avenue. Yeah. Grant Avenue, where the Gate Nursing Home is, is right next door. Um, so this story was told. Um, some of this information, Sanja and I did not realize until we started going through. Um, different um, local papers, um, the Patch, the Atlantic Bill, the NAACP, and information that um, the group has done, especially with Sandra. So I wanted to mention a lot of these are quotes out of um, information from those different articles. And just to name, you know, so you'll know how many people were on this Mingle Jack Remembrance 
committing um, is like Rodney Jackson, um, Alden Small, which has passed, James Stone, Carolyn Story Hodge, Rose Terry, Sonny Thornton, Sandra Thompson, the Paranormal Rangers are Ghostbusters, um, and also the Mayor of Eatontown, Anthony Tallarico, which we was on the original committee with us and a great supporter of the um, honorary members, um, just all kinds of other people that supported us at that time. Um, I think both well, Sandra and I are both on the EGI, New Jersey social justice thing with this new um, marker to be put up. Um, with Kerwin Webb, he's here. And he, you might be able to ask him a few questions about this. Um, our target date is possibly of May of 2022. That's correct, right, Sandra? Kerwin? Yes. yes. Um, I think he's muted. He's muted. Yeah. Um, so this goes on. There is a boulder in the park in Juan Palm Park. Um, with a plaque on it. It is not in the original place where we would like it to be, but this new marker will probably be placed at the original spot. So I am done. I turn it back over to Dr. Penn. Uh, thank you so much for that history. I'm sure people have learn something. I know I certainly learned something in, in learning more of the facts and more of the details. And um, before I bring uh, Reverend uh, Curran Webb up to speak and talk a little bit about the Equal Justice Initiative and what we're hoping to do as a, as a next step, and I know Amy is going to address that as well. We are on the eve of the murder of George Floyd. But I'd like everyone in this group tonight to think about What's similar? What are some of the parallels? What are some of the themes that you can see happening with the murder of Mingo Jack, the detail that his eyes were gouged out? So he wasn't, you know, it was like there was this violence, this, you know, this, this, you know, violence and the hatred that was blown through this man's body. The fact that, you know, he was quote unquote in jail supposed to being watched and somehow, you know, the person watching him, you know, looks the other way and, you know, this person is, um, ends up being murdered in this way. The world witnessed George Floyd being murdered. And in a sense, that was the public lynching. So go ahead, either put your hand up if you see a parallel, if you want to ask a comment or make a question, but I'm really curious to hear from people here, do you see a, a parallel to that? And the fact that this is repeated throughout history again and again to downstream, we could get to 2020 and have a George Floyd experience. So, so people are saying that they do see a parallel. I don't know, does anyone want to comment on that? In what I, ways? That, they, that they were both murdered um, by people or the cause of the murder by people that were supposed to protect us. Yes, yes. And so Molly and Rick parallel to January 6th at the White House and peace letting people cross the line. So again, somebody on the inside had to aid and abate and abet what was going on with, um, so yeah, definitely uh, another parallel. And again, people who are supposed to be in the position of protecting all people at all times, you know, people are supposed to have a fair hearing at justice. Demands in humanity demand, yes, Donna. I would speak briefly, yes, thank you, Dr. Penn. Just, I, 
it's a small, okay, so maybe six years ago or seven years ago, a lot of un very unfortunate things led to the founding of Black Lives Matter. And at that time, my consciousness became more engaged. I saw the movie about um, Attorney Stevenson. And at that time, I started to become so just, at how black people, African Americans, were just treated so casually. It's like, oh, I'm going to arrest you even though you didn't do this, and I know you didn't do it, and we're going to put you to death. And it was horrifying. And then the documentary brought it home even more because it had the section about the lynchings. And I, I, it's just, I can't understand that kind of cruelty and just. It, it's horrific, and I, I'm so glad to just try to do some small things to start to beat it back and fight against it, because it's wrong. It is a sin and wrong. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, it is, and thank you for, for being brave enough to share your voice and to speak, and thank you, Amy, as well, for your courageous heart and being willing to, to speak and you know, so it's when we speak, there's a whole nother vibration, a whole nother level that happens when people actually, you know, share their voice, when, when it leaves the body and, you know, comes into manifestation through the voice. So I'm going to ask um, Reverend Curran Webb if he would talk to us a little bit about the Equal Justice Initiative and some next steps regarding uh, placing a monument on the site and perhaps how we all can get involved to make sure that this does happen. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Penn. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, your last question, how are things similar and different? All I could think about in my mind is that when things like this happen, we understand the sides. There are the people who are perpetuating the evil, then there's the victim. But I think the one thing that has remained constant throughout is the people in the middle, those who allow the injustice to happen, whether it's because we are unaware or unconcerned or whatever. And I think that is, if we can attack that, if we can get people more aware and engaged, then it, it helps because when people know what's going on, they won't stand for it. But it's things that are done in the dark that allows such injustice to continue. Uh, where we are with the process and Sandra and Inez have been uh, champions of it and helping to make sure that this new coalition uh, continues on and, and honors th the work that was already done. We've recently, um, started working into our committee. So we have an educational awareness committee uh, that Amy is a part of and has done uh, tremendous work with the film documentaries and conversations like this one. We have the historical marker um, committee that is tasked with the planning and execution of that, that event, uh, soil collection. We're having, um, we're gonna have a soil collection at the site that just kind of helps us to symbolically remember the blood that is in and the soil and the stories that come along with that. Uh, and then also in high school, high school essay contest. The essay contest will be la launching uh, in September, I think. And the award or the scholarship winner should be announced uh, somewhere in the spring of next year in co uh, coordination with the dedication. The way that we could use help is to help us with the committees and, and a lot of the planning. The biggest part for me, the most, I think, important part of this project is the educational awareness piece. How do we get other people to know and understand what is happening, um, the history of slavery, the history of race relations in the North, because there is that big assumption that, hey, all of that evil stuff happened in the South. Um, but then it, people are surprised that New Jersey was the last state, right, to get rid of slavery. 
Uh, a lot of our higher education institutions benefited from propagated slavery. And so just having those conversations, but also not just pointing out the bad, but helping people to recognize how is it that we move forward together uh, collectively? Because there is clear, uh, there's a clear distinction between good and evil. And it seems that helping people to call into question some of those policies and practices that allow us uh, to continue to be in this spiral that allows a Mingo Jack or a George Floyd, that's, that's the important part. And that's where we can come in handy because a lot of what happens, it's small conversations that we can talk to people about. It's small things that are going on that we can enlighten them and then invite them to do more research. And so we do invite you all, um, our coalition meetings, our group meetings are on the fourth Thursday of each month. So the next one coming up is this Thursday, the 27th. And we invite you to come and join and see, what's, see what we're all about. And the way the, form, the way that we've set it up is we'll have breakouts with each of the committees working, uh, doing some planning. And so you can come and, and see where you fit, where you help, um, where you can serve. Or if you have ideas for things for us to do as a coalition, we'd be open to those as well, because the, the idea is to get the community involved so that it's not just a small project that's happening on the periphery, but we want as many people involved as possible because that's how we believe change happens. Okay, thank you. Is there a website or a contact number that you could drop in the chat? I will, our, we have some um, Remembrance Coalition info on the Red Bank NAACP website. I'll put that in the chat. Okay. Um, and I can give my email and if anybody wants to, I can make sure that you get the Zoom link for the meeting on this Thursday uh, yes. as well. And what time is the meeting on Thursday? 7 p.m. And are these meetings recorded? Um, I don't know if the last one was recorded. I was working and I wasn't able to make it, mm -hmm. um, but I can, Sandra or Inez, do you know if, if the last one was recorded? I believe so. I guess you would have to ask Pastor uh, or Tim. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Or Tim. Or Tim. Because we had okay. quite a few people. Okay. It, okay. It was, it was excellent. It was excellent. So, yeah, I think all of that information about the Red Bank chapter, the NAACP, all of that is important, you know, for people to find out about it. And it's about people of consciousness getting mm -hmm. involved. So everyone's participation is welcome and everyone's participation is needed. Yes, as, yes. As well, as well. So um, I'm very excited to, to learn about this and to champion this effort I think this, this is extraordinarily important that we are part of this equal justice initiative and that this be memorialized and this marker be placed. It becomes a part of national historic landmarks. It gets registered and the story gets told. So now I'm gonna ask another question to this wonderful group and just ask you to put it in the chat. And I'm honored to see another special guest has joined us, Ms. Gilda Rogers. <laughs> and I'm very happy to see uh, Gilda here. She is my friend. She is, and I'm so honored to call her friend. She's an activist. You might know she spearheaded the efforts for the T. Thomas Fortune House becoming a nationally recognized historical landmark. And I, I'm going to ask her in a moment, I'm going to give her a minute to think about this because she didn't know I was going to ask her about the importance of um, getting these stories told and then beyond that, you know, bringing them into history and getting them memorialized. And again, you know, it, it takes a village. It takes all of our awareness as well as our activism. So I would like people to drop in the chat how many of you, again, it, of whatever color body you're living in, know in your own lineage, in your own family line, that there was intergenerational trauma or terror? You know, there are a lot of lineages uh, represented here. And then if you are perhaps living in a black body, if you know that there was a direct, you can point to racialized terror that occurred in your family. Go ahead and drop that in the chat. Okay, thank you, Reverend Kerwin there. So 
if you know that there was intergenerational trauma that occurred in, upstream in your family, or if there was racialized trauma, uh, racialized terrorism that your family was subjected to. Because again, you know, it's like, we don't know our neighbors, right? You know, we might have people here who are descendants of Holocaust survivors. We might have people here that are descendants of indigenous people. Who knows what the stories are? So, you know, to have empathy and awareness and sensitivity to each other. Now, I also would like you to drop in the chat, you know, we're all here, we're all people of certain amounts of privilege. But if you're a person who, for example, you had a black nanny or a maid or a worker, that was, you know, a part of your upbringing, you know, so, you know, what was your awareness? What was your interaction? you know, historically, when you look back in your lineage, or if on the flip side, were your family members a part of the serving class? And that's the relationship we're talking about here in this area, you know? That's the relationship that we're, we're talking about here historically between people who look like the brown and black faces on this call and people who have the white faces on this call. When you look at the clusters of where people with black people lived, it was in juxtaposition so they could go be maids and be nannies in Rumson, in Middletown, in Little Silver. And just, you know, look at the chat. So you can see in the chat that, you know, the, you know, the, the level of experience. And so while, you know, on the one hand, you might downstream, you know, you know, professional this and educated this, and, you know, there was a price to pay. There was a path to that. You know, like I had a father who absolutely forbade me to learn, it was so, this was an ongoing argument. I couldn't take any like home ec in high school, forbade me, absolutely forbidden. He said, you'll be dead before you'll be someone, before you work for somebody, before I'll let you go work for a white family, before you'll be in any subservient role. I wish I had learned a little bit more about how to balance my checkbook and how to use that keyboard a little bit better. But, you know, he was absolutely passionate about that because he had seen that even though, you know, his, his family history was different than my mother's family history. And his family had not really known poverty in several generations, whereas my mom was born in poverty. But he was like, he was all about that. He was like, oh no, you won't. Somebody will work for you, but you will not. So you're not even gonna have the skill set because I forbid it. 
And that's the trajectory is for you to be uh, a secretary. Not that there's anything wrong, but he just didn't see that for me. He did not want that for me. And he didn't even want it to be in my skill set. He said, I, I just want you to be useless when it comes to that. I want to develop your mind so that you direct people. You know, so the passion of that, right? <laughs> Miss Jones is saying your dad may have known mine. They might have, <laughs> for sure. But, you know, a lot of people don't realize that there are a number of, of um, African-American parents that felt very passionately about that that this was you know, not going to be, it wasn't what they wanted for their children. And it was their way of, of fighting for that. So thank you everyone for sharing your stories um, in the chat. You know, this is important information. So yes, Irish Catholics who were forced out of Ireland and came to the US in the midst of the Know Nothing movement and terrorism of Catholics. It was not enslavement, but it was terrorism. Absolutely, absolutely. Ah, my father was a teen during the time and knew the location of Emmett Till. And again, that was also just, you know, absolutely racialized terror. And, you know, be, again, you know, that was something that, you know, went nationwide. So two important anniversaries occurred this weekend. We had the anniversary of the Tulsa riots, what ha happened a hundred years ago, and there's still a few survivors from that. And then we had the um, anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And what's interesting when you think what has happened downstream up until those riots that took place in what was known as the Black Wall Street, patents produced by African Americans were on par with patents that were being produced across the boards by white Americans and all Americans. And so this genius was being poured out, it was being recognized, patents were being given. Well, after those, that, that murder that occurred, that mass murder, again, that racialized terrorist sent a signal out. You could do everything right. You could be living in your own community. The white folk had gotten rid of you. you know? you're, you're living amongst yourselves. And again, a young black man was accused of whistling at a young white lady in an elevator. And it brought down the wrath and this violence and destruction was blown through this community. Well, the impact that that had on the black intelligentsia and the black capital, it's like it took all the wind out. So in terms of patents and invention, it fell off almost completely at that time and it has not been on par since. Because you get this feeling of why bother? Why try? It gets passed down generation after generation after generation. And that is some of the price of you know, racialized terror. And it cost all of us. That cost the entire globe. All those generations of black brilliance lost gone and we can't ever get that get that back again um you know the those images of Emmett Till and the fear that that planet and generations of black boys and black men that still lives to this day and you know it's just so it's something for us to wrestle with something for us to think about all right so Miss Rogers I'm going to bring you on why is it so important that we as a community get involved and get behind this equal justice initiative and memorialize and get this monument place in Eatontown? And why is it so important that we tell our stories? Well, I'm a journalist. By trade, that's who I am. So stories are important. Um, that's how we understand who we are and why we're here and what we're here to do. 
all right? I became a journalist because I wanted to give voice to the voiceless. So obviously there are stories that, you know, T. Thomas Fortune was a story that no one knew about. And now we, you know, people are recognizing through our work at the Cultural Center, his voice and the difference that he made in our society, all right? So the same thing here, um, all these lives that were um, terror, you talk about terrorism, you know, we have an exhibit now, the Great Migration. So when we talk about terrorism, people leaving the South in droves because it was not safe. Like you said, whether you did the right thing, it didn't matter. You know, I mentioned in the chat that my grandmother was a, a living maid. You know, she left North Carolina to come to uh, New York looking for a better life. And that's what it's been for African-American people throughout the history of us trying to make our way in this uh, place called America and not recognized, you know, for who we are and our contributions to the society and our mistreatment globally in the diaspora and all of that. So yes, these stories, Mingo Jack, um, I'm gonna say relatively is, you know, something I'm just really finding out about, you know, within the last few years when this project launched, I did not know about that. Most people don't, don't even know that uh, New Jersey was the last state to um, abolish slavery. I'm working on a project with, you know, the Monmouth County Historical Association of interpreting the stories of enslaved people at their um, different sites. Because now, you know, trying to, these people had lives, they mattered. They matter. And that's what this is about. We matter. Whether you want to look back at it, um, not acknowledge it because of the painful memories that it resurrects. But that's the truth of what this country has been about. So here we are. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, Maya Angelou, one of my favorite quotes, there's nothing more painful than the pain of an untold story. And I'm so grateful that we are finally, you know, telling these stories and that it's on such a per personal level with, you know, us as local people sharing our stories and sharing, you know, what happens in our own families and our family legacies and lineage. And, you know, seeing the points of commonality and the points where, you know, we can lock arms and kind of, you know, lean in there together. And then also to question and to understand the importance of asking the question. Because again, I'm fourth generation Red Banker. I did not know about the story of Mingo Jack until about, you know, 2012 when the project was first uh, underway. Although I certainly do know plenty of other stories of racialized terror because of what happened in my own family. And it's interesting now, you know, some more stories that are just starting to, to come out and, you know, what those experiences were like, where people who were subjected to it, you know, saying, you know, what was, what was it like to grow up having that experience? and how that impacted their lives and that that story matters. And I'm also equally uh, proud about the fact that, you know, I'm living in a community because we talk about, you know, adverse childhood events. We talk about, uh, you know, that landmark study. We talk about, we're now talking about intergenerational and racialized terror, but there's also a flip side to that, that we can also pass down epigenetically deep joy and, and positivity. And we're in a community where there's two great examples of that, not the only two, but certainly, well, I thought of three, the work of lunch break. That's a place where people can get involved. 
I know Inez Hennessy has been involved with Lunch Break for over 30 years now. Um, I've been involved that long, uh, first growing up, um, before there was a lunch break, hearing the stories and the dream that lunch break would come into existence. And then, you know, you know, literally watching it to coming into existence. And, and now from going to being a volunteer to being on the board of trustees, the story of T. Thomas Fortune. Yeah. It's like Gilda had a wonderful store called Frank Talk. And I was up there teaching yoga classes and she talked, you know, we used to talk about, we were aware of the history of this house and those conversations and bearing witness to those conversations. That was back before I went to medical school and, you know, back when the house was abandoned. And, you know, so these converse, these transformative conversations that downstream bringing good into the world, bringing healing into the world, bringing possibility. So while we are bringing to light and, and talking about such devastation, I want people to remember that we're also a community that has brought healing and awareness forward into the world as well. And those conversations are important too. The other uh, good news story I think in this area is the, you know, the Parker Clinic. Um, again, I believe that healthcare is the birthright of a citizen. And until we get something straight with how we're gonna do medicine in this country, to be able to have a Parker Clinic, to be able to have the Visiting Nurses Association, just trying to get basic healthcare to people and basic healthcare information and literacy. So there's, there's also things to hold on to, to feel good about, to get involved in, to in, enlarge and then be more inclusive, get involved with the uh, Red Bank chapter of the NAACP as we've heard about tonight. And so you might- uh, Carol, can I just yes. for one second? Uh, to say that we're um, partnering now with Mammoth Medical Center to bring the Doctors Parker story um, to, a, to have a permanent exhibit at the Cultural Center. So that's going to start happening in a matter of probably of a few weeks. So that again, we're talking about telling those stories. So people drive down Doctors Parker Boulevard and, and they see the, uh, what you said, the um, Parker Family Health Center, but to really know the story behind this amazing family um, is something that many people don't know and should know. Right. So, yeah, so we'll be doing that at the Cultural Center. So, you know, everybody stay tuned to that. Yeah, that's very, very, very exciting. Very exciting. And, you know, there's the story, the intersection. Dr. Parker Sr. wrote my mom's letter of recommendation to attend Howard University. And I found those original letters. So, you know, the intersection of the, you know, like the black families that have been here and the black families that broke through the levels of poverty and into the professions and became educators and homeowners and contributors to society and how they interacted um, and at another time. But there's also a tragedy contained in the relationship between the two families that has to do with uh, the fact that Dr. James Parker Sr., had, he couldn't admit any of his patients to any of the hospitals here in this area because mm. none of the hospital allowed do Black doctors to have admitting privileges. So there were people who suffered and died and that occurred in my family. And there was a great sadness between the two families because of the death that occurred because this, in the case it was a child who was not able to be taken care of at hospitals five minutes from his front door. So that's a part of the two red banks as well. That's a part of this racialized terror and the stories that we need to bring to the forefront. So here, you know, Dr. Parker and then his son, 
you know, what they were fighting, what they were carrying, the sorrow that they bore, the burdens that they bore from being, you know, competent, trained and licensed. And yet he couldn't admit a patient or take care of a patient at Riverview, at Jersey Shore, at Monmouth Medical. And the cost again to the African American community. And again, that's a part of racialized terror. Yes, it is. And that's, you know, a part of the broader discussion and the abolition and the reparation that needs to occur in this community for, for us to reach our full potential as a community. No, it wasn't the 1950s. This death occurred in the 1920s. Yes, Sarah, you're, you're muted. I just wanted to know when, and that's, you know, indeed the question of reparation, you know, and acknowledgement, but also there's a question of reparation. And there is a big question. Um, you know, since I have the mic for a moment, um, I, I guess there was a couple of, um, like Teresa mentioned, her father was in the area of where Emmett Till was lynched. And I was wondering if Teresa wanted to talk about what, how that affected her father, just because he was so he was close to that and um and then on the sort of on the, and on the flip side um the uh i think it was molly or rick who mentioned having a, a woman a black maid as a child and how you had asked earlier for people to talk about how they as children had viewed the people of color in their lives who were in whatever positions but particularly in positions of service but and I have another question, but I can wait because I just wanted to sort of pick up those threads. I'm sorry to, I don't mean to derail or, but. Um, no, absolutely. Just to, yeah. Teresa, do you want to go? Ms. Jones? I'm here. I, I had an interruption. I missed the question. I was just going to, I was asking if, if your, if your father talked a lot, if he talked about his, how it affected him or how you saw that he was affected by being exposed to racialized terror as a, as a child, as a teenager. Okay. Well, I think everyone black in America has the unfortunate part is those that have not had to address it or recognize it have not understood that. And now because we have social media, most of you are seeing what those of us as people of color has all have always known. Um, those that have heard me before, I'm originally from Mississippi. My both my parents, born and raised, long history, all the way back into oh, I can trace us to back to the early 1800s because we were also native with some British thrown in there. Um, one thing people also need to understand, everybody black and brown in Mississippi and Louisiana area were not slaves. There were pockets of free blacks. Um, some of my folks were not always enslaved on property, still have 130 acres left outside of Jackson, Mississippi that's been passed on through generations. But my father and others, they were, my grandparents and great grandparents were also involved in civil rights actions and activities. Um, with Megar Evers and all, they were rebel rousers and they were outspoken and they stood up for what they believed. I also have family that were in Louisiana that had to run out of Louisiana and change their names because of altercations they had gotten in. And I have a cousin who's still alive who was a freedom rider who had to leave Mississippi, who's just in the recent years come back to visit very briefly. But my father was one of those people, he didn't wanna hear any nonsense from people. He owned his own businesses. He would demand respect from anybody black or white. And he's known in the area where he had his business Asbury Park very well. 
I had to open up a door to throw a fire inspector out because this character had a tone of voice that my dad did not want to hear and was not going to tolerate. And my brothers and I were raised that way. We, we were raised that we are qualified, we're, we can be educated, we are educated. You stand up for your rights, you don't allow anyone to talk down to you any old way. And if push come to shove, push them <laughs> or shove them, depending on what you need to do. So he, he also said that when they were children, elementary school, they sang the Negro National Anthem in Jackson, Mississippi every day before school and they said their prayers. Um, they were taught a lot of the black history that people are, or the, 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 the full history that many people now North and South do not understand. But he also said that even as, after they came up here, many people here were selectively in denial about the racial tension that was here. My mother had a job for a minute when she first came here in a nursing home in Ocean Grove. And one of the patients called her a nigger. And my mother said she slapped the woman and she quit the job. She said no one was ever gonna talk to her and she was not gonna have it. And that was in the early 60s. So that's where I come from. But my family was very vocal and they stood ground and we were taught how to stand ground. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that's also you know, a, a story because I think that's, that's part of the collective legacy of those of us downstream of those ancestors. You know, it's, it's a great title for a book. We were taught to stand ground. Mm -hmm. You had to, you had That's to, right. in order to change the conversation, to survive, to change the paradigm, you had to uh, stand ground. Right, and we, we were not encouraged to have servant titles. Even looking back in history and doing the family trees, my people were educators, mm. or they were in the medical professions. My grandfather taught at Prentice Institute in Prentice, Mississippi. Uh, I can go back, his parents were school teachers. So we, you didn't do a servant thing. That was not acceptable because if anybody is to say anything out of the way, you were not going to tolerate it. Uh, even in the military, everybody gives all the veterans, veterans get it. My grandfather came back from France from World War II and they wouldn't even recognize and honor them. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's another story that needs to be told. So my grandfather, um, my maternal grandfather, he was the first man of any race that was enlisted from Monmouth County. And, you know, there's a little write up about that in the newspaper. Yet when he returned after, you know, giving his service, was he able to obtain the, the GI rights? And was he able to, you know, get his due as someone who participated and served this country? And, you know, we know the answer to that. No, they weren't mm -hmm. able to participate. And, but it's interesting, you know, as I find these, you know, these clippings and these, you know, these breadcrumbs to the, you know, the family history. And, you, you know, kind of wonder, it's like, yes, you know, it's time to tell these stories. It's time to put it together and put it out there and to stand ground, to stand right. ground and, and for people to understand the complexity of the relationships. And also, again, perhaps the reparations that are owed in so many cases. Correct. And this, the town, a city of Tulsa, Black Wall Street was a tale of many other communities on Route 80 or Highway 84 in Central Mississippi is a marker where Mount Carmel, Mississippi used to be. There was a lot of burning and pillaging, even Seneca Village, Central Park today. So everybody has to start looking at the real history. Don't be in denial. It's been whitewashed. It's a lot of ugliness, but people have to address it. And then uh, someone said earlier that the churches don't want to talk to or uh, talk about it. Well, when you talk about it, you have to face yourself. And oftentimes 
people want, don't want to face who they really are. Everybody in a church is not going to heaven. <laughs> I'm just putting it like that. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, my next question for everybody is, you know, so we're all here for a reason and the pandemic perhaps has sparked many things and has uh, the murder of George Floyd brought a lot of things to a head. The Trump years brought a lot of things to a head. Where do you all feel in terms of, um, if I were to put out the words, ally, accomplice, activist, or anti-racist? You know, and you could be anti-racist and an ally, you could be anti-racist and an accomplice, you could be anti-racist and an activist. Where do you feel you are, you know, on that continuum? On, and I'll give a couple little brief definitions. So, you know, an ally is someone, you know, who, who you know, has empathy. And you know they're they're willing to be in a conversation like this. Now an accomplice is somebody who's willing to link arms and dig in and be inconvenienced and be inconvenienced. If they see something, they're going to say something. And they're in a room, and the room is like, okay, well, you know, there needs to be some more diversity of thought and consciousness in this room, and they're going to speak up and they're going to to say something. So if, if someone is not speaking, they're gonna, re, they're gonna include them. They're gonna wanna hear their voice. So that's the accomplice. And of course the activist has the skin in the game. You know, they're gonna be out there. They're gonna march, they're gonna protest. They're, they're going to join the Red Bank chapter of the NAACP and they're gonna make sure <laughs> that, you know, this marker happens. You know, they're going to be, they're going to support Reverend Curran and the, his leadership and the work that he's trying to do. They're not going to be satisfied that this happens. And, you know, they didn't do anything, you know, to make this a known part of the history. You know, how could I be a fourth generation Red Banker? And I know about my own family, but not know about Mingo Jack. Any of us. Of anybody that we're living, how could we not know this about a, you know places? You know, there are times where I feel like I'm in Eaton Town every day. You know, how could we not know this? You know, how could we not know that it wasn't until um, when I was about to be born that Dr. James Parker Jr. So we're talking in the mid 1950s, becoming the first African American doctor to have admitting privileges at Monmouth Medical and at Riverview. What happened, what, what happened to all the care to you know, all these people that might've been your nanny or your mommy's maid or your grandmommy's maid? Where was their health care? How are they getting health care? All the way up to you know, 19, 1950. And it was miraculous. So there was, you know, Dr. Parker and Dr. Wiley, Dr. Parker Jr., who were able to do, make a way out of no way and literally save the lives that they were sa saving and caring for a community that didn't even have access to fluids. Something as simple as a saline drip, life-saving fluids. So we have someone, I consider myself an anti-racist ally in process of learning the other roles. Go ahead, thank you so much. Oh, Anne had to leave, uh, Anne saying I'm an anti-racist striving to be an accomplice. So do we have any other brave souls who are willing to put it in writing? So part of the first step, one of the first steps in transformation is commitment and writing it will take your vibrational frequency to another level and speaking it takes it yet to another level. So I'll put mine in the chat. I will ask other people to speak up and I'm not speaking up or making it a public display. So an anti-racist does not see 
one group as being better than the other or one group as needing more help than the other. Anti-racists anti recognize groups as being equal and on a journey and needing to participate, learn, grow, and evolve. Dr. Penn? Yes. I think Molly wants to talk about her experience from childhood with okay. a person in the house who was in a, who being dominated by the society without her realizing it. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, Molly, but I see you leaning forward. I've, I've, sorry, I again, I don't mean to derail. I've, well, thanks for the question, Sarah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so, um, I have, um, I'm, so my dad was a doctor um, and uh, he had to wear dress shirts every day. My mom had six kids. Um, so Miss Alberta came to our house on Tuesdays and did the ironing. Um, sometimes she'd come a half day on Wednesday. I understood at the time that mom always had to go pick her up from the bus stop. Um, we lived a mile away from the a main road and um, and actually mom would have to go down to the shopping center to pick her up. And <coughs> um, she's from East St. Louis. Um, I think she probably had to take two buses just to get to the shopping center by us in the suburbs of Western part of St. Louis County. Um, uh, you know, um, mom would go to Women's Guild at church on Tuesdays, and sometimes I was with her, and sometimes I wasn't because I had to go to school. Um, to, like I remember, I guess kindergarten, either morning kindergarten or after kin afternoon kindergarten. So I was with uh, Alberta all the time. I'm surprised my mother was pretty. Uh, my mother grew up all over the South, went to a lot of different schools. Her dad was a carpenter during the Depression, so. Once he finished one project, the family would have to move to another one and they were pretty poor. Um, so um, I'm surprised she didn't have us address this woman as Miss Alberta. She was just Alberta. And I realize now how um, um, degrading that was. Um, she was fairly elderly, not in great health, had a lot, you know, swollen legs, um, grumbled a lot, wanted to wanted me to shut up and <laughs> she could watch her shows while she did the ironing. Um, I remember I tied my shoes or for, you know, first time I was able to tie my shoes by myself. And I went in to, you know, express how excited I was by it. And she was not really excited by that. I was a little disappointed, but my mom wasn't home. So, um, but I think um, our dog always was like, would be crazy. Like we would definitely have to tie him up and put him away when she was around. Um, and if any black person came to our house, our dog would really go crazy. And we did, I just never understood why they are, you know, the dogs were so, uh, got, you know, expressed a lot of viciousness and all, cause we didn't train the dog to do that. You know, unless my dad had a, my mom and dad had a, a defensive, you know, air, Air about them that the dog picked up. Um, but um, I had a girl in my class, Gita Dash, who was from, her family's from India. And so she was very brown, she's very dark brown. Um, but we knew, and this was in the mid 60s. So we knew, you know, we knew all the stuff that was going on with um, uh, Dr. King and all. Um, so we would ask a lot of questions. I really didn't have any black kids in my family or in my class until I went to middle school. I always wondered why the black kids would stay and, and eat at their own lunch table and all. Now I understand. Um, but I was very lucky at our school in a wealthy suburb of St. Louis. We had a couple of uh, African-American teachers. We had black literature and black history. Um, and I took those courses. I was one of the very few white kids who took the course. And I tried to be a part of the Black Image Club. And I realized now that was a, probably a mistake. But, um, but they had the best dances. Um, like <laughs> 500 people would show up and 
<laughs> Lily White Ledoux and uh, oh my God, you know, 500 black kids would come in and it was like so awesome. It was the best dance. And, uh, and I always wanted to be a part of it because I really like to dance. So, um, so I think actually having, seeing some stuff on TV and hearing the news because my mom listened to the news all the time and having uh, Miss Alberta um, with us made me wonder what was going on. Also, when I was eight, my cousin, my, my um, father's brother-in-law died and his, or my cousin, she was the, she's the eldest and I'm the youngest. She was always the mystery, you know, ooh, Linda sighting. Um, she married a black man. He looks like Billy D. Williams. Um, and he still looks like Billy D. Williams. It's still um, really nice. And uh, so apparently my uncle disowned her um, and we didn't see her for a long time until he died. And then we were able to see her again. So um, her, so I have uh, five cousins that are uh, mixed race through him um, in Chicago. So, so I think, I don't, so I don't know, maybe, you know, the fact that I was hanging out with uh, Alberta as a kid made me want to uh, be more aware. So I think I was always looking at stuff. And my dad would have some stories <clears throat> as a doctor working in downtown St. Louis um, for black families. He always used the term colored. We're like, dad, you can't use that. That's all right. <laughs> he, he did to the day he died. We just couldn't get him to change his uh, terminology. But um, yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. You know, it's, I think it's important, again, courageous conversation to show up, you know, the languaging, the fact that this older, mature Black woman was taking care of you and she wasn't titled properly. You know, she should have been Miss Alberta, right? Yeah, she should have been. And I, and I confirmed that with my cousins, I mean, my siblings. I said, did we call her Miss Alberta or just Alberta? They said, no, it's just Alberta. It's like, oh, that's really odd. Because my mother, I tried to give her a subscription to something and I sent it to Patsy Walker. She goes, no, it should be Mrs. Willard B. Walker. And she made me call up the magazine company and have her address label changed. So um, she did good. She married a doctor and you know, she, she did good. And but I have, I've showed Carol, uh, Dr. Penn, a picture of my sister. Um, I'm 1% Nigerian. So according to Dr. Dr. To Dr. from Dr. Lewis Gates, that means I'm, I have a sixth great grandparent that is black, that was from Africa. Mm -hmm. And if you saw a picture of my sister uh, in the summertime, especially once she was 10, you would be like, hmm. And people at, at Barnes Hospital in downtown St. Louis just would say to her, are you white or are you black? They used to come out and speak to her because she has very tight curly hair and we have full lips and uh, she would get very dark in the sun. So here, Dr. Yeah. Carroll said it just bubbled up into her. It did. Sometimes we, you know, that root, you reach, you reach. There's those, you know, and it can go either way, right? You know, that genetic um, imprint in terms of the phenotypical appearance of someone who has, you know, African American blood, European blood, Asian blood, you know, downstream, just depending upon the combination of the, the genes, right? So thank you for, for sharing that. And again, that, you know, that's a, you know, that's a story. That's a place to look, you know, that awareness, that languaging, that privilege. So, you know, perhaps it was important to your, your mom, you know, the privilege of being a doctor's wife. Again, you know, to have that, even though she came from a poor background, she wasn't, she wasn't Alberta, you know, to, mm -hmm. you know, to be a, a step above this woman living in a black body and this woman who was in a position of servitude, you know, for your, for your family. And, you know, these, these are important stories. These are, it's important to understand the relationship. It's an understand, it's important to understand how you carry yourself in relation to other people and where and how and when our privileges show up. Mm. 
and not yeah. to let it remain in invisible. You know, to bring it to to consciousness, and then we can move with it. We can shift things. We can do things with it for sure. Now, does anyone else have any comments, stories, or reflections that this wonderful conversation confronting racial terror is bringing up for you? What's it calling up? Oh, uh, yes, Judy, and then Miss Amy. Question: I I guess for years. About why both friends and encountering Black people every day, they are willing to be cordial towards me. When my little white face bopping around, the embodiment of white privilege, why the anger is always repressed. I think if I had the same experience, that it would be really hard to be kind for the most part um, and tolerant and willing to meet people almost always more than halfway and it just it it, it boggles isn't the right word but it, it consistently it's well beyond intrigues um, I, I'm just incredulous almost that with the racial terror that's been subjugated to a population for so long can maintain cordiality in the face of a dominant culture? Well, that, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's a very powerful question. And sometimes I wonder myself. And I think part of the answer was it was survival. You know, you knew the potential of violence being blown through your body. You know, not just like you just shoot me in the head and I'm dead, boom. You know, I probably you know, wouldn't even know anything, but before that I'm gonna be raped, I'm gonna be brutalized, I'm gonna be tortured. You know, was, you know that'll, that'll push you back. That'll make you think, well, I'm just gonna step down and you know, let these white folk have the sidewalk. You know, I'm, I'm not going to, to do that. And that was the, the level of terror and experience certainly coming out of certain aspects of being enslaved human beings, coming through the sharecropping system. That is what drove 6 million people to leave the South, coming to the North in hopes of a, a better opportunity, a better life, a less violent life, just the way it drove millions of people from Europe to leave Europe and all that violence and, and come to the, to the new world. There are also experiences, transcendent experiences of the black church, which was really such an affinity group, an affinity community where you could go, you could restore your dignity, you could be healed on that Sunday, you could release, you could totally give yourself over to the experience and then you know, and really it was like, you know, mindset training, you know, set your mind to go and do what you needed to do in order to put food on the table. So my grandfather used to say, look, I will shovel shit against the tide as long as they're paying me in greenback. Dr. So, Carroll? Yes. I'd like to add on to that as well. Absolutely. Judy? Don't assume that they're all happy-go-lucky and everything is smooth. And listen to what I'm saying, because that's been the story and the premise that has been used when they told all oh, those slaves, they're happy and content. Look at them. They're singing happy. What you're looking at is an internalized um, terror, trauma that's in internalized. What you're seeing are millions of people that are walking around with post-traumatic stress syndrome. And it's internalized. Here goes the high blood pressure, the diabetes out of control, the weathering of the body, the early or the shortened life expectancy. Mm -hmm. The ones most often to die quicker, shorter, sooner are black males. 
So you're seeing it in, in a different kind of way, the mental health, the depression, the teenage activities that are out of order. That is str stress that is out of control because you are stressed. You can't get a job. You weren't educated properly. You're, even if you have money, even if you have education, you still endure it. Um, infant mortality is a perfect example for black women. Even if you're well-educated, if you have money, you're still two to three times more likely to you lose your child for being black in America. The racism is the one confounding factor. So they may seem very nice and turn but if you call somebody nigga out of the side of their mouth, I bet you one of those friends may have to take a second thought before they knock you out. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I hope they shoot me dead. I mean, well, I but but don't assume that everybody's comfortable because as, as Dr. Penn said, you have to kind of restrain yourself because you can't go around killing off 50 people, although other people seem to be able to do it. But be the reality of being black in America, that is our reality because you really want to run and jump and scream. I'm a woman with a certain education, home and everything else. And I have walked into the room as the authority and people looking at me want to know if I'm the secretary. No, I'm the one in charge here. And that's still in this 21st century. So that's what was really seeing. People have it internalized mm -hmm. in many, many aspects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think too, can I just jump in? I think too yes. is what, you know, Du Bois always said is living between, black people have been conditioned to live between two worlds. We do it comfortably, you know, it's second nature. Some of us are more um, um, vocal about it in our way that we respond to it. But we know that this is how we have to navigate this society in order for it to, and it makes no sense. And it makes absolutely no sense. And we have to see it for what it is. And I was just um, with some um, educators and one of them said, this information that everybody is, you know, like, trying to get on board with equity, diversity, and inclusion. She said it's really, you know, a very uncomfortable situation for a certain group of people. And uh, a Black woman chimed in and said, well, think about how uncomfortable Black people and Brown people have been mm -hmm. in this country, you know? And when you hear a Native American person talk about how this land has been stripped from them, you know, that like, I want my land back, you know, um, you know, give me some money to have me come back to, you know, what was mine. And we don't even, you know, God forbid it was, uh, we know I'm a teacher. It's not taught that way. Even as educators, we have been taught and conditioned to feed into the myth as well. Although those who are true to ourselves and understand it in some kind of way, try to break through and bring something that is true and honest to what it is in spite of, you know, what society says around us. But yeah, this is like, we're in a really a watershed moment right now in the history of this nation. And if people don't recognize that, and try to bring forth all that they can, all that they can, all that, you know, I don't care how freaking uncomfortable you are. You know, you just have to deal with this because we have to turn things upside, you know, it's been turned upside down. We gotta make it right side up again. That everybody matters. You know, like when people say, oh, all, all lives matter. Really? You know, come on. We know, we know as human beings existing in this society that all lives do not matter. We know that. 
And it's time that we have to stop this shenanigans and nonsense and really and because we see it. Look, look at our um, elected officials on a federal level. That behavior, that says it all. You know, so they, we teach our children, at least I like to think, to be better people than what are, we call our elected officials. I don't get, I don't care what side of the fence you're on. Ooh. You know, so, you know, I, I'm sorry, Carol, for just like going off like that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is, it is so important that we understand as, as brothers and sisters, all of us as brothers and sisters, not just white and black, and white, but brothers and sisters that we all come together now to help you know, make this thing right. You know, maybe I have to, you have to give up something, you know, my white brother or sister to, you know, more than lip service and really be about it. Get down with the people. Like, you know, it amazes me to this day. It amazes me that how many white people don't have a real, real, real black friend? Like, like when somebody, I, we, I was on a Zoom and a woman said, you know, I must, and she wasn't, you know, she wasn't a young woman. And she said, I must honestly say, she was white. She said, I must honestly say, I don't have a black friend. Mm -hmm. I was like, that is like, that's like the twilight zone to me. You know, but that's how isolated, that's how we are. That's how we've been conditioned to be from the inception to where we are now, all right? So now we, the people, need to stand up and, and, and you know, resurrect something it's so valuable. And I'm done. Uh, thank you so much for your comments and Gilda, Miss Gilda Rogers, that's going to be the last word. We do like to wrap up on time and I'd like to thank our special guests, Miss Sandra Thompson and Miss Ines Hennessy for sharing this very important history, this story about Mingo Jock. Um, I don't know if Reverend Curran Webb is, is still on the call with us, but also thank him for his comments. I'm going to turn the mic back over to, to Amy and just wrap up if we have any announcements and encourage us all to hang in there. And I know, you know, the committee is going to get together, you know, whether we'll, you know, meet over the summer. I'm leaning in a little bit, think we should meet one more time in June to talk about Juneteenth, but we'll see. So Miss Amy, take it away. Thank you, Carol. I cannot thank you all enough for sharing your stories tonight. This has been fantastic. Gilda, you could come on any night and talk for the whole hour and a half. We would love to have <laughs> all of you, really. I truly appreciate all of you. Um, my, I had a quick question. I was wondering if we know of any of Mingo Jack's descendants. Mm, I don't. As far as we know, we haven't gotten yeah, to that, but I don't think there is any uh, descendants because okay. we were reaching out before, right? Um, yes, yes. Reaching out. I, yes, um, yes. Miss Amy, I do have something. Gilda is still on. Um, there is another event. It's yes. a historical yes. um, graveyard, Cedar View um, and Lynn Croft behind St. Leo Church. I'm trying to think of the the name Hurley, of the Hurley's Road. Hurley's Road. Memorial Day, the 31st on a Monday at two o'clock. Yes. There will be a presentation of Civil War. I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm brain dead. I haven't eaten yet. Um, Gilda, help me out. Re here. Civil War reenactors who will uh, serve as color guards and um, 
it it in at that cemetery. I don't know if people are aware of it, but yeah. it is it are uh, it are heads there are headstones that date back to 1815. There are Civil War black that was a, you know Af African burial site. Civil War veterans that are buried out there that fought for the you know the the you know the sanctity of this union. That's why this moment is so important is because these are people that we have cast aside, you know, who gave their, you know, their, their lives and, and got nothing basically in return, you know, so we have to acknowledge that we have to acknowledge these folks. And so like, I'm encouraging um, people, if you are it's, it, the, the, the presentation probably will be you know, no more than an hour. hour starts yeah. at two, um, but to be aware of it. So we formed, a, to make it long, really sh short, we formed a group called the Friends of Cedarview. Yeah. And we're trying to uh, form ourselves into a 501c3 so that we can really um, uh, restore this, this, this sacred land and make it a, a, a really reflective place where people can come and sit beautifully landscaped mm -hmm. and really, you know, shine a spotlight on, on and, and I, Inus, Inus is related. Her family is, is are buried out there and she will be calling roll of those um, veterans that are buried there. So Inus will be doing a roll call and we're gonna have someone that's uh, on the bagpipes that's doing taps. So yeah, so if if you you're make it, please. Yeah, just come out and you I, know. Yeah. I've never been over there. If we just drive down Hurley's Road, will we know where to go? Oh yes, you'll see it. You'll see it. If you, once you turn onto Hurley's Road and, and, and go past the church and that other little parking lot of theirs, you'll see it right there to your right. You're gonna see it. You're gonna see it. Yeah, you're gonna see it. Thanks, thanks, Gilda. You're you're welcome. Everybody, thanks. Yeah, thank you all so much. I uh, I put a link in the chat for all the previous programs. Uh, it's on the UUCMC website, and um, I I think we'll see you in June, and then maybe not for the summer. But thank you, thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a Good evening. So a reminder, the meeting on, on Thursday, um, people can join the education, the awareness raising committee um, around the monument in Eatontown. So um, <clears throat> Kerwin Webb, uh, Kerwin at Kerwin Webb, the, the email is in the chat. Um, it's an opportunity to participate and to be an accomplice. Um, you know, libraries can host events and people can join the meeting on Thursday and volunteer to recruit their local library to do an information session about Mingo Jack. And also about the pattern of racial terror in this country, because that is part of the purpose of placing the monument is not just the one incident, but the pattern mm -hmm. yep. that exists. Um, so I just want to, I hope everybody, I hope folks will join. I know people have left, but. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to keep going. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Take care, all.